Riddle me this. What has 28 moving parts and 20 tongues? That's a pretty obscure riddle. The answer is the European Union. You see, the European Union started out with 15 original members when the Treaty of Maastricht was signed and became a federation of nations. Since that time, it's added 13 more nations, bringing its total up to 28 people, 28 members. That means there are now some 455 million people that live under this combined governmental entity called the European Union. That puts it on the field rivaling the United States in terms of economic power and, uh, and uh, political clout. That's probably good for them, I would think, but those 20 tongues, they get in the way of anything, comp of them accomplishing even more. You see, unlike the United States, and despite whatever fractured ethnic lines we have, we still have one nation and one common language. The European Union is a comprised of multiple languages and multiple nations. It seeks to speak with one voice without doing away with any of the uniqueness of its member nations. So not to offend any one of them, they have 20 count them, 20 languages that they have to hold business sessions in. Now, that's got to create more confusion than a mouse in a burlesque show. It's got to create more confusion than a banana in a barrel of monkeys. More confusion than the mention of God in the Harvard University faculty lounge. Really, it's a significant complication. It means that in every session of the EU, there has to be 57 trilingual interpreters on board. No matter what happens, every document has to be translated into that country's original language. Last year, the EU spent 1.6 billion, with a B as in Bravo, billion dollars on interpretation services alone. And the money isn't the half of it. Greater still is how long it takes to get all this translation done. A lot of the decisions that were made by the EU are slow to be put into action because of the backlog of translations. Because communication has to run in both directions in each language, that means there are 380 possible two-way language documents that have to be developed. And where do you find a competent Finnish to Maltese translator or Romanian to Catalan translator? When you consider the language the language groups and the communication hurdles, it's a wonder that the EU accomplishes anything at all. But think about the epistle lesson from Acts chapter 2. When you consider all the language groups and the communication hurdles that were present on that day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago, it's a wonder that enough about Jesus Christ got across to the crowds that some 3,000 of them were converted in one day. You see, the reading of the book of Acts almost sounds like a roll call from the EU, doesn't it? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. 
And there were no trilingual interpreters at the ready. None except the Holy Spirit. The wonder of it all rumbled through the crowds. Are not all these people speaking Galileans? How is it that we're hearing them in our own native tongues? So the first public miracle that took place on that day of Pentecost was instant translation. But as we know, translation sometimes isn't enough. The text goes on to say, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? See, there were Lutherans present that first day of Pentecost. I mean, who else asks, what does this mean? Two things happened on that day of Pentecost. Not only translation, but interpretation. The crowd was witnessing a divine miracle. The word spoken in the Galilean dialect of the language of Aramaic was being heard in all the language spoken by the people that were present there. But that doesn't mean they were understanding what they were hearing. They heard the words the disciples were speaking, but they didn't know what those words meant or what this event meant. Someone had to interpret it. The EU has discovered this problem also. That's why they're always seeking language specialists who not only can translate, but can also interpret her. See, a translator can take one word in a language and put it into a word in another language, but an interpreter knows the culture. He knows the meaning behind it and can recognize when a literal translation just won't convey the meaning that the speaker intends. Thus, uh, an interpreter who writes down or hears the words love your neighbor in Aramaic knows when translating it into Greek which one of the four Greek words for love to use. Because if you choose the wrong one, well, things could get a bit scandalous. So on that first Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit was the translator. Peter, also filled with the Holy Spirit, was the interpreter. He provided the meaning. He answered the question of the crowd as to what this means. He addresses the people and tells them about Jesus, the promised Messiah, and about how believing in Jesus will bring forgiveness, abundant life, and eternal salvation. The communication miracle of Pentecost was both translation and interpretation. Have you ever considered that it's still that way today? That both translation and interpretation is needed to spread the gospel of Jesus? Translation is the work of just putting it from one language into the other language. What does the text say? The meaning of the text is what happens in sermons like Peter's or like this one, in Bible classes, in Sunday school, in Christian education moments, in family devotions, in family conversations, in small groups, in talking with co-workers and friends. Interpretation explains the Christian story, what we believe, why we believe it, how to read the Bible, what God has done for us, and what God expects of us. And all this, and in all this, the Holy Spirit is working, adding divine power and persu persuasion so that the words that are spoken changes the heart and renews the mind. 
in our culture today, we need interpretation more than ever. And you don't have to be a professional. In fact, being a professional often turns people away. There are always people who say, look, I know what Christianity teaches, but so what? Why should I buy into it? Interpreters are people like you who have not only been given faith, but also are absolutely convinced of the awesome love of God who in Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, so loved the world. Today, the best interpreters are those who can answer the question, what does this mean through personal experience? And I think all of you have had personal experience. Um, I'm pretty sure you have. I mean, personal experience is the only kind I've had so far, so I would assume you've had it too. But this doesn't mean that we have to be especially eloquent in our speech or have a convincing testimony. It doesn't mean that you have to have a course in Christian apologetics or narrative evangelism. But it does mean that when asked, you can tell others what Christ means to you and what you believe. One of the most powerful interpretation methods is simply stating from your own experience what you believe and how Jesus has made a difference in your life. I mean, you can say things like, I have a real peace that stays with me even when everything else is going wrong. Or you could say something like, I'm less judgmental and more able to forgive. I never knew a time when I wasn't a Christian, but I'm convinced it enlarges my spirit. I know a joy and contentment in my life that I never knew before. The guilt I lived with has been taken away. You could say something like, my natural inclination was to think only of myself. But because of Christ, I can no longer ignore the needs of others. It has put a song in my heart. Or simply, Christ has given my life a purpose. Now, none of these is guaranteed a conversion of those who hear it. But statements about how the good news of Jesus affects and changes you personally has a greater impact than the best written Sunday school material or the most articulate sermon. That's because nobody can deny your personal experience. Realistically, all they can say is, well, I just haven't had a similar experience. This is what the mission team that will be heading to Tanzania in 12 days now will be doing. We will be sharing the faith and how that faith has personally affected our lives, how God's forgiveness has changed our lives and our hearts. We'll have an interpreter along with us who will translate the message from English into Swahili. But we will also have the Spirit working as well, adding its power to those words to change the mind and renew the heart of the hearers. We will be witnessing firsthand the power of the Spirit as people confess their faith in their Lord and Savior and are brought into His eternal kingdom through the sacrament of holy baptism. What the team will experience will remind them of the power of that first Pentecost day. We probably won't see 3,000 people converted in a single day, 
But the last time I went, there were over 600 people who confessed and were baptized. So I ask you, <laughs> beg you, to please pray to God that even now he would send his spirit to work in the hearts and the minds of the Sukuma people of northwest Tanzania to prepare them to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's really not all that different right here in the United States. You and I get to share a simple message that is imbued with divine power. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Although it's a message from long ago, from the beginning of the church, it is still a message packed with power that fills our hearts, our lives, with forgiveness, with peace, and with hope. For some people, you may be the only interpreter of faith that they encounter in their life. That's because Pentecost isn't just a single day in the church year. Pentecost is ongoing. The Word is still proclaimed, and the Word is still being interpreted. You are the interpreters for Christ. Don't just go to church. Be the church every day. And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.